Is that you starting? We are rolling. All right, this is Stephen Sloan. The date is August 5th, 2015. Uh, we are in the A. Webb Roberts Library at Southwestern Theological Seminary. And this is an inter interview with Serge Gasori. Uh, thank you, Serge, for sitting down today. And this is an interview with the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission's project, uh, Survivors of Genocide. Um, it, it is an honor to be able to sit down with you and take some time for you to share your story today. Um, I would like to begin, if I could, um, with some of your family background. background. So before we get to the events of, of the genocide and the, those events of the 90s, I'd like to hear a little bit about, I've heard you share some in your book about your family background, about your grandfather, um, and about your parents. And so if you could share a little bit of your family background, that would be great. My name is Serge again, Gasori. Uh, I was born uh, in Rwanda uh, in 1986. Um, my mom uh, was from um, uh, in a, was in the same was from the same area as my father, and um, they were married for um, four years. And um, after that, my mom passed away. Uh, my mom was killed. Uh, after my mom was killed, um, I moved and went to live with my uh, grandmother. Uh, we were in a, in a small uh, village. Uh, I can easily uh, run uh, five minutes and I'll be at my grandmother. Um, for my mom um, and I can run three miles and I'll be at uh, my father uh, my father's parents so we were like in the same area and also in my country the way you um, the way you um, you identify family is different than the way you identify your family in the United States. Because in my country, what we call a family is our cousin, our uncles, our brothers from uncles, our gra grandparents, our great great grandparents. All of those are a family. So, but here in America, when you talk about a family, you're talking about uh, father and mother and ch children. Mm -hmm. um, so. So in this village, a small village, you had a lot of family. Yes, I had a lot of family. That's what. Why, if in my story I talk about my family being attacked, uh, be careful how you're gonna interpret that. Mm -hmm. Now, I know when you were very young, I think your parents, you lived with your grandmother, but your parents worked my, in the city? My father worked in the city um, because that's where uh, jobs were available. Um, and my, my mom, also before she died, she worked in the city as well. Mm -hmm. And in our culture, a lot of times when um, um, your father is working and your mom is working, your, um, your grandmother backs them up. Um, your grandmother can take you and you can live with them and then when they're available, they can come and get you. So it's not like, uh, you know, you, you're gonna have a babysitter, um, something like that. And now I know your family had cattle, of course. And so a lot of cattle. Yeah, so there was livestock to take care of. Yes. Uh, that must have been, along with school, part of what you had to do at a young age. Yes, um, I remember at a very young age, I would take about, I remember seven years old, I was responsible enough to take about 50 cattles in, in, uh, in a pasture to, to go get uh, food. And nobody would feel uncomfortable because they knew, I knew uh, all I, I can do to, to take care of them. A lot of responsibility for a young 
yes, a lot of responsibilities, and uh, and and that is in my mind too. That that is in my it's it's a great memory. Um, you know, in my book, I talk about um, you know the smell of the cows, and you know, remember times when I had to to go get you know extra uh, food for the cows, no matter how what I did to to get them. Um, you know, mi milk was uh, you know a treasure to us, uh, and still it is right now. So. So when you say the, the the family had a lot of cows, so they were doing fairly well. Yes. Okay. Um, what what's so fun about that is that you might have um, two hundred cows, but you can't afford to send the children to school, or your children can't afford to drink a tea with sugar. And when you look at that, it, 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 it's a it's an issue of a lack of education because parents really don't see why they're going to sell one cow and buy you school uniform or sell one cow and buy you sugar to drink with the tea or sell one cow to pay your tuition. So they would later have you sit home, but they will still have their 200 cows. So and if they got money, get another cow, right? Yes. So <laughs> they they were they were very rich in a sense that you know they they would just hold on to that their treasure. Mm -hmm. You know, if in in my culture, if I give you a cow, one cow, it's worth it, uh, one million. That means I I honor you. I I'm very appreciative. Uh, of our friendship, um, and that's a way to show that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, livestock is very yeah, important. Yes, yeah, very um, important. you know, my, my wife, um, my br bride price for my wife was cows. And How many cows? 12. 12 cows. 12 cows. Very valuable. Very valuable. <laughs> yes, they would let me pay that, those 12 cows instead of paying $50,000. So. She was worth it, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. <laughs> I'll pay more than twelve. <laughs> um, so, some other uh, memories from younger. I know you had an uh, an aunt Agnes that was very you, you see your grandmother's right hand. I think is that her name. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, my grandmother. Uh, basically, my daddy's mom. I see. Uh, his daughter. I see. Um, Agnes and. Um, Agnes was a right hand to my grandmother because she, while others grew up and went in a city to look for jobs, she, she stayed in the same neighborhood. Uh, and that's how she became a um, right hand because she would come and check on her. Um, she would make sure that um, when she's sick, she gets um, medication. If she needs anything that some of uh, had other kids needs to provide, she would reach out to them where they were living in the city, you know, and so she was, she was very, very helpful to my grandmother. And of course, uh, as a child, you know, I was getting sick here and there, um, you know, I had to get punished for some, you know, behavior, so that was a person who would come and, you know, put putting me back online. Well, I'll ask both those questions. Uh, what did you get in trouble for? And if you can think of some examples of when you got in trouble and how would they punish you? Uh, I got in trouble for, um, I, I was very popular. I was uh, one of the, those children who knows everybody in the neighborhood. And, and um, I can, remember everybody's name, first name, last name, where they live, their family members. So I was out I was out there in the neighborhood all the time. So I would get in trouble for disappearing and, and um, not getting jobs done. Because um, as a child, you, you have to take some uh, responsibilities. Um, at four, age, four years old, I was uh, going to get water from uh, what I wear. And that was probably about 10 miles. So 
if we didn't have water to wash dishes or uh, to drink or to cook with, my aunt will come and uh, put me back in line. But I, I can tell that you liked your independence. I mean, you liked being able to go out on your own. Yes, yeah. I, I, yeah. I like independence and I'm still uh, <laughs> getting in trouble for it at my job. <laughs> Yeah. Um, one thing that, that I'd like to ask about, and this is something that uh, I want to ask about this, your early years, something as an outsider, and, and the people that will be watching this are outsiders too, it's very important to understand, that sometimes it's hard for us to understand, is the Hutu and Tutsi and, and, the, and the differences there. And, and I know at a younger age, I think you say in the book that you didn't know, you didn't notice as much of a difference, but, but I'm wondering how that comes to you and how you begin to understand the differences and things like that in your story. Um, the, the way, the way, um, colonies, uh, taught, uh, divisions, uh, in my country, Rwanda, it, it, it's kind of, um, uh, it's kind of confusing because um, they will say, oh, because you are tall, you have um, sharp nose and you are skinny, and then you are automatically a Tutsi. Uh, they, use, they even use to measure uh, how tall your nose is. Um, and also they will come back and say, oh, if you are short, uh, kind of heavy say uh, guy or you be a Hutu um, and then they come back and they say hey if you have a lot of cows no matter if you are short or tall you're automatically a Tutsi um, and then they come back if you are a, a businessman uh, you don't like cows then you become Hutu. Um, so it's kind of confusing. So when I was growing up, um, I can hear those things from people who are older who knew what they were talking about. And basically I was always watching a person who's short to, uh, to identify myself uh, uh, basically to separate myself from them. So if you were short, have a big nose, I'll say, oh, you are a Hutu, period. That's probably at school. Um, but when, after the genocide, when I got education, um, I started to read the history and I realized that really there is not a true connection um, to based on what they say, um, based on what they, on characters that they, um, I, I'm trying to find a good way to put it this sure. way. It's a very artificial division, right? Right. Yeah, one group, another group. As you say, part of it physical, part of it cultural. Culture. Economic, yeah. Right. But we still find people, you know, who are short, but they are Tutsi. Mother, father, they are both Tutsi, uh, but they are short. And when when you study biology too, you you find out that you know there is no connection whatsoever. Um, be, 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 I mean, between um, becoming short and being a Hutu. So. Well, as a as a child. I mean, as far as uh, who you could play with as a child, who you could associate with, maybe even church life. I mean, how did that play out? Uh, when I was in school, um, because the way the government was say, set up was that the president was a Hutu. A president would try to surround himself with Hutu, of course. Maybe here and there, uh, put one, two, two, two. And then that escalated um, down. Um, 
and so you find the headmaster is a Hutu, and you find out that the most of the teachers are Hutu except probably three just to cover themselves. And then all of a sudden, um, they have education. They come back, they train teachers not to not to mix children. So in school, they will come and say, Hutus, you stand here, Tutsis, you stand here. And that's basically, they were trying to create divisions among us. So, and that's how it started. Um, I'll go home and I'll say, ask my grandmother, I'll say, today they told us uh, as, Hut as Tutsi to stand up and go outside for an hour. And she'll be like, um, my son, I'm, we used, we are used to that. So, because the the government was very supportive of divisions, um, it, it, it was it was happening the way they wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm wondering if, even if you're playing football, if you're, I mean, is it is it Tutsis on one team and Hutu on another team? I mean, those divisions. We we would play so soccer. Yeah, soccer. Uh, because it's very popular yeah. uh, in my country, especially on the African continent. And sometimes we will be in the same team. Mm -hmm. But when you want to hurt anybody in, in the team you are praying with, you will hurt the Hutu. Mm -hmm. Or the Hutu will hurt you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you know how like in a, in a game, if they want to kick you out of the, the game, they, somebody might come and kick you in your knee. Mm -hmm. So if, if a Hutu, you know, really got a good training from their father or their teacher, they'll come and kick your knee. Mm -hmm. um, because teachers, parents were teaching you those divisions at home, at school. Mm -hmm. So if, um, I, I don't, think Tutsis were doing that ma much mm -hmm. because they were worried that they would get retaliation. Mm -hmm. So Tutsis were the one who were doing that mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. They would even like wait for you in your way home and, and even beat you up um, like a snake if they really got those divisions uh, training from their father, their mom or their grandparents so now another thing i know was important early on in your life is church that was yes. a big big part of your life can you yeah. tell me about that yes church for us was like you know how you wake up you you know you wash your face and you know you you brush your teeth and you get a breakfast so it was the same to us, the church was like, hey, you work from Monday through Saturday, Sunday morning, regardless, you gotta go to church. Mm -hmm. So, and that didn't mean that it was because you are a very good Christian or you knew what you was going there to do. It was more like a tradition. Um, yeah. I'm going there because my grandmother goes there, my father goes, goes there, I grew up seeing my grand my great grandparents going there, so I'm gonna go too. Mm -hmm. So, so church was very important, and um, was so what made made it so popular again. In my area is because um, we had a very small Catholic church um, that had white priests, and so you know we we felt honored to have white priests there. You know. Um, white priest who, you know, we, you know, they, we, we were very kind of like, oh, we have a better preacher than, than yours. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that that's why we have a big, we had a big number of Catholic before the genocide. We had a lot of white priests and everybody would want to go to the white priest church. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a status kind of a so yeah, status, status yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and it's still like that today, you know. But we don't have uh, many white priests anymore because um, after the John side, because the the Catholic um, Roman Catholic were very involved in the in the John side, 
um, having their member killing people. Catholic is not a popular name in my country anymore. Um, so yeah, more Protestant. Yes, yes. yes. Um, well, I I know things changed dramatically after your second grade year. Yes, because that uh, you know that is April nineteen ninety four. Yes, when things began to change. And I know a, a big event in there, and a very clear memory for you is the death of the president. Yes. And the, the news of that. So, can you tell me that story, just that, as, as you remember it, how that news came to you, and maybe how your family reacted? And, okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's the part that really describe um, what I had to go through. Okay. So, at night. Um, you know, we, we've lived in those divisions uh, at school, in the neighborhood, uh, at church, and w we've learned that um, the president is a Hutu, the president is not happy about um, Tutsis, and he wants to do all he can to exterminate uh, all the Tutsis. Um, he, he wants all the Hutus to get Tutsi's belongings and become rich. So those things are things that we've been hearing. Uh, and um, we've been hearing that um, there is a group of Tutsis that are outside of Rwanda in Uganda who wants to come back and rescue us. This is the RPF? RPF. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we know Excuse me. We know that group is coming to save us, but we don't know what type of uh, power or capacity they have to be able to to get us out of that situation, mm -hmm. to to win over the government, you know, the the Hutu government. Mm -hmm. So we were just like, okay, what's gonna happen? And I, I'm I'm gonna say that. People were old enough uh, who, you know, who are listening news, who are able to kind of like uh, um, understand the situation. They knew that those people outside, they could probably come and take off. Um, but at the same time, uh, that time, both, part, both uh, sides were having peace talk. Um, uh, the, the Hutu government and the Tutsis who are outside in Uganda were both having peace talk. But really, for us, small people, we really didn't know sure. what was going on. So young. Yes, and we, we will often hear that, oh, that's a game. We will continue to die. That's a game they're playing. That's a politic. Um, I know you, you said you <clears> heard <throat> stories. There were stories floating around about Tutsis that had tried to some that had left and joined the RPF, yes. some that had tried to leave and join the RPF. Yes, my uncle was one, yes. one yeah. of them. And um, so, and, you know, people have been dying here and there um, in the neighboring village, um, and we got to where we were used to it um, because the government was killing people um, in... Um, different areas to kind of like uh, discourage um, people were outside um, or revenge uh, I'll put it that way and so we got to where we were used to it you know we hear gun sounds we run away we hear bullets we we run here we're hoping to come back so it became a reality when the president, the Hutu president, was coming from a peace talk uh, in Arusha, and his plane was shot down. Um, to me, as a young kid, very stubborn, really, that didn't mean a lot. Beside, you know, I felt so good. I was like, okay, now he's dead. I've been learning that he was the person who wanted to abuse us and kill us and do all those kind of stuff. So I was, oh, great. 
But I look in my grandmother's eyes, it's something else is, you know, is telling me a different story. Uh, because my grandmother, you know, she knew she was, you know, she was like, if the prisoner is killed, they're going to come back and bring us Tutsis and they're going to come back and retire and it's going to come to us. So my grandmother was like, um, be careful, be careful about, you know, what you say, how happy you get, how, 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 how far you can go being happy. Um, and so at that very night, all Tutsis started getting scared. Uh, we went to bed without knowing what's going to happen next day. So we went to bed. Um, I woke up. You know, I thought life will continue like it used to be. Grabbed my bucket, my way to go get water. Because in every morning, yeah, I wake up and go get water. And I went to get water. In my way, I met a person who was working at a Catholic um, headquarter in my uh, city. His name was Gregoire. And he uh, said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to, tr uh, to get water so I can come and shower and go to school. He said, no, I was my way to go to work. He was with his bike. Um, and I learned that uh, people are being killed, uh, so I'm coming back. He said, oh, go back home again right now. So like I said, in my culture, anybody's your father, anybody is responsible for your safety. So a person can see you in the street doing something wrong and they'll punish you. And your father will still be okay because you know it's, it's more like social, it's a community. What can I do you know, for you when you're not there? So him telling me, go home, I can't question that. I gotta go home. It's a person who works at it. Catholic Church is a person with respect in the community. Okay, you go home. I go home. So after that, I went home. I told my grandmother what was happening. She was like, yeah, I knew that. I knew it's going to happen. Um, so at the same time, we can hear kids screaming, cows, um, you know, making noise, uh, goats. Uh, you can see smoke uh, of houses being burnt uh, on the other side of the, the, the village. Uh, you can have a sense of uh, chaos, um, um, but I can see that but in my dream, but I guess my uh, grandmother can see that as a reality uh, unfolding. And... Um, so we start putting our staff together. Um, my grandmother was like, oh, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to head out and uh, go where everybody's going. Everybody that time was heading to, to the church, to the Catholic church. And our biggest hope was, um, you know, nobody's gonna come inside the church and kill us. So as I'm talking to my grandmother, I was putting together our mattresses and all our belongings, um, people are walking down in the street. A lot of people in the street, you know. Of course, like I said, livestock, life, livestock is a treasure for us. So when I leave my house, I gotta go with all my cars, all my goats, all my chickens. So in a street, um, small than where you and I are sitting, you find a cows, people with their belongings, mattresses, and, you know, it, it was chaos. I can't even describe that movement uh, of that time. So we headed to church, um, and as we, we are going to church, people are coming with uh, blood on their head, and we say, what happened to you? Oh, they, uh, my neighbor just, um, just, uh, beat me up with a, uh, with, uh, that is a stick with uh, nails. Uh, they used to get a, a long stick and put nails on it. So 
and that was one of the they were whip weapon the traditional weapon or they just hit me with a stick um so we moved to the church and uh, when we got the church for the first day it was it was fun you know not many people were there by that time but the people were still coming coming from all different directions can I ask you a couple of questions? Yes. Well, one thing I know that was very important was the radio. I mean, as far as getting information to try to get, I think you went to a neighbor's house. Yes. Before the move to the church. Yes. To try to, yes. So, so what did you, because I know you also have RPF radio that, I don't know if you have access to it then, but they have their radio, they have information. Right. And then you have the, the state run radio and so can you talk a little bit about that yes um on that night when um no first of all on the first day we didn't move to the church uh, -huh. uh so we people kept coming down passing by our house uh, from all directions heading to the church uh, because we were living under a hill so uh, we stayed home but few Houses in our neighbor uh, stayed there. The, those were Tutsis too. They stayed there, and we had a Hutu neighbor. Uh, I talk about that per, that family as well in the book. Mm -hmm. And um, when we stayed there, we tried to capture any news we can get. Uh, so the truth was, we're gonna be attacked. We're probably gonna be killed next day or next hour but can we capture any uh, news that is out there? So the way we would uh, learn about any news is to turn on uh, uh, Rwanda Nation National Radio. So when you turn on a Rwanda Nation uh, uh, National Radio, National Radio, all they're talking about is, you know, stay in your home, don't move. Um, we're gonna kill cockroaches. Uh, we're gonna uh, pay back uh, for you killing about president, things like that. And then the we had Muhabura radio, which was RPF. The rebels who were coming from Uganda to come and uh, rescue us, who had a radio, but the radio was in a mountain. So sometimes you have a frequency, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't. Uh, some sometimes you can hear it, sometimes you can't. So um, a lot of times when you wanted to hear it, you go on a high hill and, you know, maybe if a family living there, you hide. I remember when we were trying to listen to that radio on that night, we had to go under, some people would go under the bed to turn on a radio and, um, or you have to close all the doors so you can, you can hear it and your who to neighbor won't know that you are listening to the RPF um, radio. So really, uh, we were listening to that, to the news and that night, but we were desperate, too desperate already. So listening to it or not listening to it was, you know, useless. Yeah. Did you have any interaction with your Hutu neighbor right after the... Yes, so uh, the I talk about that in the book, uh, my neighbor, yes. Um, this is a neighbor who we used to share food, you know, great time when they had baptism in their family, they were inviters. If we had baptism, we, you know, we would invite them. Um, if um, they needed any kind of help, they would come to us. Um, if we needed any help, we, you know, we would go to them. I used to hang up, hang out with uh, one of their ch children. Um, and so when the genocide started, when the, the Hutu president's plane was shut down, it really didn't stop us right away. Uh, it didn't stop us from interacting. Um, and, and you can tell that some families, some Hutu families were as much as confused as we were. So and they will try to stay on our side a little bit as long as they can 
and that's that's when they you know they came to us they say hey we're going to okay let me explain to you what happened well even if up to this time mm -hmm. when things like that when people in a neighbor in a village are attacked or there's they have a sense of attack coming they do neighboring watch do they call it neighbor neighborhood watch, watch. Neighborhood watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they do neighborhood watch so they'll come to us and say oh the president was killed um and there is some um, um security instability so we are joining other people um in neighbor in neighborhood uh watch mm -hmm. so they will leave they'll say oh we're going to join our neighborhood watch uh in this village so they will disappear during the day and they will come back at night and so i remember there's a time they came back one of the the one of their boy who was i mean he was a grown man one of their men came and and he said oh serge he was like my very very good friend he would you know he would pray with me as a as a children um as a kid he came to me he had a machete with blood on it and <laughs> Asked him, I say, what's on your machete? Uh, or mach and he say, oh, it's blood. I say, well, blood from what? I say, from cows. And he say, oh, we had a lot of meat, and I'll bring you some tomorrow. <laughs> and knowing that that machete was was used to kill people from the other neighbor uh, village, so. Um, and our relationship really all of a sudden just stopped just because they moved their whole family, moved it to another camp where they were staying. So basically Hutus went and created a camp for themselves in another, um, in another village, so just smaller suburban area. Mm -hmm. So and that helped them when they wanted to come and to attack us it helped their plan because they would you know talk about what they're gonna do today how many people we're gonna kill you know how many cows do we need to get from them who's gonna attack this neighborhood who's gonna attack this neighborhood so them being in a concentration camp really helped them you know putting plan together to kill as many Tutsis as they can. So uh, after they disappeared, uh, I didn't see Celestine until after the genocide. I can't even remember if I talk about, I talk about him. So I, I was trying not to talk about it because when he came, they killed him and, uh, and I still remember that. And as, uh, as much as I, I hated him because, you know, he was among the killers. I hate to see him being killed because he was really, he was killed right away over there. He, I know he uh, asked for forgiveness, but it was too late. People were already angry, sad, upset, but, and they you know, killed him like right away. And so. Now, now you said that before the genocide, you had seen training. Yes. Was this the, was this the militia that, that was doing some training? Yes, that's uh, Mauritius in Herahamwe. Um, okay. So basically what happened was that uh, right before the genocide, so that takes us back um, to the Ukori pre-genocide. Um, so when they were doing all they can to teach those divisions. Um, basically, they were preparing for the genocide. And so that's when um, they had meetings, you know, they had political parties, um, and they would meet on a certain, certain days. And during those meets, um, meetings, 
they'll have you know their members their pro um members and um they will teach them how to to manipulate uh small people uh in uh, people with a lack of education how do you manipulate them so what they started doing after the meetings i talk about in the book i talk about um political party meetings um after that they will get a kids and train them um how to kill people and they will use police from the district to come down and train kids young kids how to how do you kill a person real quick um how do you kill ki- a baby how do you kill a uh, old person how do you kill uh how do you defend yourself if a tutsi were to attack you so those were just like normal um like on saturday they will have after the political party meeting they will have young kids who came to that meeting they will separate them put them in a small bush and train them so that was a really normal um we just when you see a, a group of young people on saturday afternoon you won't think it's a bible class you say oh that's that's a hutu that they're being trained but um at my age i couldn't even ask oh why i was like okay it's, you know it's it's them it's hutus so but people all people they knew what was going to happen yeah well we can go back to you know you leave and go to the church one thing that raises a question for me is your cattle is extremely important. Yes. So how how do you flee and go to the church and make take steps to guarantee? I mean, I know you, your family has to be thinking about that as well. Right. And so what what steps do they take to try to um, take care of the possessions or the cattle? Um well say say that again. So you flee and you go to the church. Right. Um, are you having to secure your, I know some possessions you bury in the backyard to right. try to keep them safe. Are you also taking steps to try to make sure your your cattle or your cows are yes. safe? Yes. We yeah. we did it, but it didn't work. Okay. Um I uh, I remember my uncle who was living down uh, down the hill. Um he came and got some cows. Um and uh we kept some cows. And the reason why my uncle came and get it is because um mere people were under um impression that they would be able to defend themselves and keep their cows. So that's why my grandmother were like, "Oh, okay, here Eugene, you come and get all the cows." And then me and Serge would just run, you know. So we we gave we gave him all the cows or everything. Um we probably kept like probably about five cows who we which we took with us at church. And my uncle we heard that because on the first day he didn't move the second the first and second day he didn't move to the church. But uh he kept um he stayed where he was. And the the whole reason was to defend himself and maybe he can keep his cows. But on the third day he was at church with us with no cows. Yeah. So we they when they attacked them the first day, they took all the cows. So they came at church with no cows. And our cows we had in front of the church, they disappeared one by one. Yeah. So today you still you see your cow over here, oh You'd be happy that you, your cows is still here. Tomorrow, it's gone. Um, and and we try to live off of, you know, our cows' milk uh, for a while, but it didn't stay like that for a while. All of a sudden, it just stopped. Especially on the third day when when we were attacked, that just took away everything. Now the the idea of going to the church was the church would be a safe safe haven yes safe haven mm-hmm. that, that even the 
because they're, the Hutus are Christians as well, so the right. idea would be that they wouldn't attack you. Sure. You know, our country had the highest number of Christians, mm-hmm. uh, above 90s. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, everything you would, I mean, somebody coming and attacking you in a church, it would be the, the least um, thing to think about. And so I know there's a first occasion where the militia comes to the church. Right. Can, can you tell me about that? Uh, Mauritian came um, at church um, the first day. No, no, the, 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 so the first day, uh, I'm talking about the, fir- the first three days at church. Sure. There is actually one day I really don't talk about when, you know, when we, after the, the president died on the, at night, and then in the morning, we had the neighbors move to the church. We stayed there. Mm-hmm. So when I talk about the first day, I talk about the next day, which okay. is perhaps the yeah. second day or third day. Okay. So, and then on a church, on the first day at church, really we didn't get attacked because when they came, so this is a neighborhood, and the Hutus are coming from here and here and here and here and here from all directions, all pointing at one direction, one, one place, a church. So we had guys who would try to defend themselves. They would go in, into these entrances, all these different entrances to the church and defend us. So on the first day, they were able really to defend us. So Hutus came, but really didn't approach us. But they were able to get hold of our cows, our belongings, you know, because they, when they were coming to church to go, they would pass our houses. So, um, and then on the second day, we started getting weaker and weaker because um, the government heard the Tutsis were trying to defend themselves, and the government said, no, they can't defend themselves. We can't continue to use uh, traditional weapons. We, we, gotta, we gotta send uh, help. That's when they sent, uh, they started sending um, uh, army, military. Mm-hmm. And they even started sending um, army who were like uh, secret, secret services, um, who had very heavy weapons. So we started getting weaker. One, uh, some of our guys who would defend us were, were killed, and um, and after they died, and then we were desperate. You know, nobody there to defend us. Mm-hmm. So second day, they came. We were uh, the one of uh, the group from us was able to push back a little bit, but they, all of a sudden they lost it. So they attacked us, but they didn't get inside the church. They were able to kill people who were outside, okay? So, you know, after they killed them, we buried them, and life continued. The third day, they were the worst, the, the last one. Um, they came, they were ready from all direction, from all angles, all corners, but at church. Um, you know, we would, um, we were, for the past two days, we were like, every morning you go home, it's very early in the morning to see if you can get some uh, food from houses, your homes. And on the third day, we thought it would be the same. We, we woke up very early, went to our homes, where we, we, where we were calling our homes, um, got some food as soon as we get at church, bah. Um, Hutu is with all kinds of weapons. Um, but for those who were very smart, um, who knew what was going on, they, they can sense that. Right now, that's when I started to, to see, but when I was writing a book, I can start seeing that people were old enough, they can see what was going to happen. Because the day before, they came and took all the strong, smart, educated people who were among us. They took them, and they, we don't know where they took them. They, sh- they shot some outside. They took some to, to keep them away from us. So we went, it was coming. 
but I, I, I would be lying if I say mm. that I, I was seeing that I was so basically you was leaving your moment as you tried to leave I mean I don't know we probably we were not numbed um, we didn't have a feeling or thinking about the future when your grandmother was trying to protect you she wouldn't have told you what was yeah. no and so at that age you also think that everything is is a game you know so and then um so um on that day i'm sitting with my grandmother inside the church um the church is packed you know all the way you you'll be very lucky if you find a place to put your feet down and my grandmother was always comforting me and she said come over here so i slept on her uh, thighs and um all of a sudden grenades started coming in um you hear kids screaming um bullets coming in through from all angles and you know it was out of control my grandmother you know who was a very good christian she stood up she said you know it's getting out of control gotta go join people who are up front in front of the church in front to the art on the altar uh in a church praying hoping that you know they would die you know praising god and singing so as she stood up you know i'm always a child who was always with grandmother and you know as she stood up i'm like you can't leave me behind i need to go with you so she she walked to the um to the front and as we, we reach between the the first um chair and the altar a grenade came and just took her uh, just hit her and i was kind of a few steps behind her and she just busted uh, when she busted i got confused i have some bruise here in my head but I had blood everywhere in my body. Um, there was no way, you know, to look back. I just ran, um, finding where I can escape, how I can escape. So I ran through the window, uh, the door, and um, there was a street between the church um, ground and the other side. So ran through across the street. And I ran nonstop. I didn't look behind. And as as I get um, a little bit farther from the church, there was um, um, a hole. Um, there's there's these holes we 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 we, we dig for um, to protect our lands. Uh, I talk about that in a, in a book. Uh, so a policeman saw me running. And he shot me um, because as we were exiting the church, some Mauritian family and police and armies were out there watching who's going to escape from the church so they can shoot them. So the police, this police that I know, a police who was uh, my neighbor, who actually killed uh, his wife and his kids before the genocide started because they were Tutsis. And so his name was Zach. Um, he saw me, started shooting at me. And when I uh, missed the first bullet, all of a sudden I fell down. Uh, somebody had pooped over there. And so, and it was a rainy season. So I slipped into it and it just threw me into, the, uh, into that hole. So he lost the target. Um, I kept crawling, crawling, crawling until the, he couldn't see me no more and kept running. So I kept running. That time I was like, I'm not gonna stop until I reach the last point. So they came inside the church and killed everybody they can find. Um, some of the um, killers knew my family. So they were able to, they basically did it as a hobby um, to kill people and then they would stack each family. They'll make a pile of um, each family. So that was kind of like 
you know, a game or f for them. So after that, um, my cousins, my uncles, uh, my uh, sisters, all of them there. Um, so I kept running, I didn't stop. Uh, I even passed my, the place where I went for primary school, which is where most people stopped at. But I didn't stop at that place, I just kept running. So when I got into the bush, um, it was a, um, a bush mixed with banana trees. Um, I ran into a group of uh, guys. Um, I can't really remember the num the number of the guys, but the guy there were guys that I knew were from my tribes. Uh, tall guys, you know, I was still show young, and, you know. So they saw. Oh, first of all, I thought they were they were killers. So I was about to really run away, but I look at them. Oh, oh, this is third. Okay. Uh, so we joined each other. And they I can't really remember if they met by accident, like like I did, or if they moved um, together from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So we start running, um, running, but they were very confident. They had some uh, weapons, so they were very confident and they were strong. So after, after I met them, I was like, oh, th this is it. I'm probably saved from, uh, from now. So we stayed there. Like I said, they knew what how big the situation was. I didn't. Yeah. They didn't want to go back. They just stayed there. In the bush. In the bush. Yeah. And um, all night, we were like, okay. They, were, they started talking about um, going back to the church, find out who survived and who died. And some would question would be like, hey, so if, how about if we go back and then we get attacked again? And then, um, you know, some will be like, um, we'll be all right. Or we can go hide where they, they've already finished to kill. So we, we merged into a bamboo bush that was nearby. And this bamboo bush uh, has like a soft ground. Um, and we kept uh, going through that bamboo bush and it got dark. Uh, of course, that time really nobody had electricity that area, and we kept, you know, walking inside the bush. Nobody knows where we're going. I don't know if you know about the bamboo bushes. When it's too big, once you get in inside it, you can't really know where you are, especially when they're too tall. Because really, you can't you can say, oh, that's the 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 here, or that's. Four Wolf, that's uh, Waco, that's, you know, you can't really tell. So we were in there in the middle of nowhere. We don't know which direction we're going to head to to go back to the church, to our house, our homes, or even find another uh, safe area because at that, that time, at night, you will hear noise on this side, you hear noise from this side, noise on this side. And those were Hutus who are, were having fun eating cows they, they got from Tutsis. Mm -hmm. So we, every time we, we were like, oh, this is our exit to go home. Oh, we will run into a, a big party um, of Hutus and we'll find out that's even far from our homes. And we will go there. You know, because like, you know, the genocide was everywhere. It's not like, oh, Fall Off was safe, Waco was having trouble, and, you know, San Antonio was um, a little bit safe. No, everywhere was, the situation was the same. In the book, I think I use, uh, when you spray insecticide uh, to cockroaches, uh, it's going to touch every cockroach. So you'll be seeing chaotic in every area. So we stayed there. Um, by God's grace, we found a direction going to our homes. I know one thing I remember, um, in the middle of the night, I was kind of getting s sleepy. And 
you got to wear even like because the the bamboo bush has some areas have a lot of water so you can easily um um you can easily get trapped in the water and even go a lot, a lot deeper so um i remember getting sleepy and i was about to get um cut in that and uh one of the guys just grabbed me and said oh don't stay behind and you know they 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 helped me they helped me and um once we got out um everybody was like what do we do do we go back to the church do we go for some reason they knew that the school didn't get affected so they said oh let's go to school so and that's where many people were uh those people who survived the church a few of them they went and camped at the church, at the school so we moved from home we went to the church we came from church we went to school so that's our third stop mm -hmm. our our yeah basically our second stop and um um so we went back to school uh, me and those guys but the plan was oh let's go to school we see who survived we go to the church maybe get to see uh, our family bodies and then let's go head out to the bush there is a bush that was nearby the, that was very popular and they thought that was going to be a safe heaven mm -hmm. so as i got to the school everybody's celebrating oh you survived how did you survive we saw your ma your grandmother's body we thought you died with her so everybody's hugging me my you know my brothers who survived simba the one i talk about in the book they're hugging me oh they are bringing me milk food here and there um and then they, so we so life became normal again and then the question was like when am i going to be killed next time uh, perhaps for others i i mean for me i was like okay i'll take it um move you from rest, here you could eat yes yeah, get yeah. rest and i was like hopefully this is it okay so i head out to the church i say i gotta go so i went to the church in my way i uh, met my cousin who had survived the church at the church and she said no your grandmother is dead already i i knew that she was dead so i continue going to the church and here i walk in in the church my family is here uh, dead bodies um my cousin um was trapped in the under dead bodies dead bodies um she called my name and i heard my name i said who's that so i tried to walk away and she called my name again so that's when i called other people that were there and I said come and help me so we had to push um dead body that were on top of her and we put her out um her clothes were completely red she had blood everywhere in her nose her ears um her eyes she was covered everywhere so we took her out uh we washed her took her to school and um up to this point she's she's alive so um and then um we moved back to school so at school it was another home so at school they um they continued to attack us but they kind of gave us like a break mm -hmm. um i don't know that's probably because they thought they've done a great job so they took a, a small break and then um probably a day or after two days they came back again mm -hmm. very very ready basically and like like we did at church we those who survived tried to defend again ourselves and to defend us. Um, I remember that time everybody had to participate at that point. A, a, a female, a mare, a children, um, a, a child or a old, or young, everybody got to participate. So I remember we, you know, we would get a stones. I remember I used, I had a wheelbarrow I'll be pushing stones to take into the front line so they can because we were fighting that time with stones and and you know 
we didn't really have the weapons that are really strong because we we never got we we didn't get ready for it mm -hmm. you know the killers they were ready because they got training ahead of time you know and they you know but for us it's probably one machete you left in your way out um um a stick you used to use for your cars um so we were not ready mm -hmm. um so we fought them um several occasions on several occasions trying to defend ourselves at to the point where like we were like we can't really do nothing so and the 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 government used to have a um a helicopter uh that would come and you know cycle around uh, our concentrate our camp mm -hmm. and they'll go back and take a report and say oh this is a number of tutsis that needs to be killed mm -hmm. uh, this is the number of people who who were killed so we this is how much work we need to do so as we were defending ourselves chigari uh, government which is the hutu government oh they they learned that we are defending ourselves and they started to spec to speculate that we might have tutsis i mean a uh, rpf among us mm. so they uh, they came up with a plan to bring a, um, a soldier at night and put that soldier in a tree so when we wake up we were sleeping in the classrooms uh, rooms mm -hmm. um, and um, so we woke up in the morning you know whoever have uh, you know kids they will probably go out of course so they can find food so we come out in room, out, out of classrooms we hear bullets you see a children falling down a, a, a old person go falling down a, a young person you know so it was like who's killing these people people falling down all the time you know you you be walking the street you be, be shut down so people started questioning themselves all of a sudden this guy who was a very uh who's a hero in our neighborhood um who was there his name is mohun de fider uh, i don't remember if i talk about him uh, in the book and it was so funny in my book i'm very like run out of my book i'm like i left a lot of things behind <laughs> so um he um he saw the soldier in a tree and he had uh, this uh, traditional weapon we use uh, it's called um, um, one they used to hunt like a bow and arrow yes a bow and yeah. An arrow yeah. yeah so he had one and he he says he basically gave up his life and said okay i gotta show him so he, he went under the tree um several guys tried but he sh he shot them down so because they were un below him and he was on top he was able to shoot them easily but the last guy got him so he f he fell down when he fell down it was like everybody wanted a, a piece of his clothes you know shoes or shoe race or, or anything you can get from him you'll be very happy oh you killed the government person oh how so we felt very very happy like i said mature people they really knew what was going to happen. Killing a uh, government soldier, wait, you're gonna see what's gonna happen. But I, I was probably happy to get one of his shirt, you know, because I wasn't um, anticipating what was gonna happen, going to happen. So um, after they killed him, the government learned that. They killed him like about eight in the morning by 10 10 30 11 a.m buses like like i can look on a, across the the hill i can see like 10 buses those are big buses like greyhound and each bus has had soldiers in it you can see green inside buses those are like so secret service coming from the government from the capital because they've 
um, they suspected that RPF is there. So it's basically armies that are coming to fight army. That's what they thought. They thought that they had army. So they came. I, I really can't really describe what happened that time. I, the last memory I have is that when I saw those soldiers. The other time I found myself, it was raining. Everybody was running, trying to find a way to survive. Uh, we ran from that school. There was uh, this, long, this long street. That was going all the that will go all the way to the bamboo bush. So I just we just took off and ran. Ran. In the in the, it was raining. It was wet. Um, but bullets was also top of a rain. Uh, because you be running in the street, you see a person falling here, a person falling here, a person falling here, a person falling here. And you really didn't have time to think about what is what was next. So um, everybody scattered from the school. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it was like, you know. And then um, we went, we left. Those who survived the rain of bullets went all the way to the bamboo bush. Mm. That's probably our, our third stop. We got into the bamboo bush. Now the question is like, what is next? Um, now, did, didn't you have an encounter with a female soldier? Yes. That yes. Yeah. That was um, when uh, we were fighting against the uh, militia in Heraham. Uh -huh. um, so w when we were at the school defending ourselves, uh, when I was pushing stones and taking them to the, um, to the front, front line where strong people, mature people were defending ourselves. Um, we had a female who was, um, who was among the, the killers. And this female had, um, had a sign that said that she was new, a new wed and she wanted belongings for her wedding. And so... Wanted to take the, the, your, your group's belongings. Belongings for the wedding. For the wedding. Yeah. So, um, um, so they shot him. They shot her uh, with uh, with a ball, a, a ball. Um, and when they shot her, you know, I, I have. There was a time that after everybody, well, after we won, basically, mm -hmm. we won that group. So when we won, she left there not dead yet and um i remember she on over here she had the, the um hello is that hello uh -huh. yeah mm -hmm. she had it uh in in her here and i remember guys trying to because you normally won't leave your arrow in somebody because that's it means losing mm -hmm. so i remember guys cutting her trying to get it out just for the sake of getting out it wasn't for the sake of finishing her. It was the sake of getting that era out. So it's just a traditional thing, mm -hmm. a mindset people have that if you leave your arrow in somebody, you they can come back and defeat you, or you you lost the battle. So I, I don't know the you know. The, so um, she died there. Uh, so many people died that day because our guys were very dangerous too. You know, you, you know if you know you're gonna be killed, you you have nothing to lose. You 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 step up and you defend yourself no matter what happens. So, um, so she died there. Um, I remember passing on uh, her her, bob, her dead body for many days because all the time we were running. Um, there is another story I don't remember if I talk about it in a in a book, but I talk about Toa, uh, the Twa tribe mm -hmm. being used uh, by Hutus, mm -hmm. where because Twa is basically another tribe in my country that really nobody talks about. Mm -hmm. It's more like um, it's like uh, the minority. Tutsi, yes, minority, but we don't talk about. Twa, a lot of times we talk about min minority 
and majority we talk about Hutu and Tutsi in Rwanda because Twa they really don't care about power mm -hmm. um, if you can give them food that's it they don't even need your clothes they just need food so, were, were there several Twa families in your no, no many. No. They they lived in the jungle. I see. So okay. I don't even know. I don't even know where they lived. Mm -hmm. Besides, I seeing them coming to sell some some of the pots uh, they made uh, off of uh, mats. Mm -hmm. So um, Hutus because they knew Twa can do anything as long as you give them food. So they use them to really do the work. So I remember when Twa came and, um, uh, to us with, um, to, to come and attack us, and they passed by a house where, the ha in that house, the, the owner of the house was, before he, he fred, he was cooking meats. So they smelled it and they wanted to go get the food. Because like I said, all they care about is food. So they jumped over the fence and um, went to eat the food. And our guys, they, they saw them jumping over. And they went there like, it's like, imagine if you see somebody who was coming to kill you, what, what are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. And you knowing that you've lost all your family or, you know, you are just, it's only you who's still alive and you see a person who was coming. So they really killed him really badly two of those guys. Um, I remember a rich person in my um, neighbor um, who came with, uh, with his truck and he had killers behind in, 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 the, in the back of the truck. And he came, um, as he approached our, our camp at the school, he had some grenades. Uh, these stick grenade, mm -hmm. uh, I've never seen them in here, mm -hmm. but these are stick grenade and he was trying to throw it and he didn't throw it in a good way and came back and hit him. Mm -hmm. So he busted, he didn't die right away, but our guys is like, oh, thank God. So you can't get, uh, you can't get away from us. Mm -hmm. So we, we were defending us as much as we can. It's mm -hmm. just that when you're fighting with the government, really do you really can't do much so um so at the school we left the school now we were in the bamboo bush so it's our safe haven good, very good cover right it, yes yeah, it was yeah. it was very big mm -hmm. but i'll tell you it became a street mm -hmm. after a while all of us living there walking in in it it, it became uh, like a street because we were stepping on those uh, bamboos. Mm -hmm. So, and the helicopter from the government will come every 5 uh, p.m. to check on who's still alive, how much they can do. So, there is um, there's one day before we were, before we were attacked by the government, on that day when a lot of buses came with full of soldiers, there is a day they, they attacked us. They were very strong, but maybe not that strong. And I remember when we ran uh, all the way to the bamboo bush, but we came back to the school again mm -hmm. because it wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. And then, um, that's when I uh, rolled, over, rolled, rolled over uh mm -hmm. here and ended up in a bamboo bush and uh, met a young lady that wanted me to hide her by putting her under the ground and step on her, putting glasses, glasses on top of her and step on her. I talk about that in the book too. Yeah, trying to hide her. Uh, yes, yeah. yes. So and at that time I was to the point where, because when you was on a hill, you can easily see down in the bamboo bush, and you can even see a lever that was going through water, that was going through, that was uh, cutting through the bamboo bush. Mm -hmm. So I, when I rolled over that hill, 
going down to the bamboo bush, my mind was, I need to go and um, kill myself in that water. So I was about to go just commit suicide in that water. And um, I had all my clothes, um, my pants, I put my pants first, I put all my shorts behind. So I probably had all my, um, you know, I was getting it every time I had maybe good grades, you know, my dad would buy me a shirt or a pants and would send it to, to the village. So I was get, getting some good treatment. So I had a lot of clothes and I had to put all of them on, on me. So when after I rolled over, when I got in the bamboo bush, my clothes are already coming off. So my shorts are here, the other shirt is right here, my pants is right here. So I can't even walk and I can't get them off because I'm really, you know, when you're young, you are really like, how am I gonna lose my shirt, you know? And um, so I was like, I need to go and kill myself, period. And some um, ants went in my um, clothes. Imagine if you have ants in your clothes, your clothes, you can't even move, and then you have ants everywhere biting. So I was like, I need to find um, that even. That's, that's God's plan, because had I found it, I was going to put myself in there. But I, I couldn't find it. I would go this way, I can't find it. I could go this way, I can't find it. I could go this way, I can't find it. My uh, uncle's wife was just behind me, and they threw a grenade. No, no, they shot her over here. And she was crying, screaming, calling me. So I, I really don't even remember how we got out of that. Um, and so after a while, it came down. Um, we, we really tried to defend ourselves from the top of that hill, but in the book I talk about how they really defeated us because they had grenades, bullets, and all we had was just stones we can just throw to them. Um, so um, I'm going to go back to, um, to, the, to the bamboo bush. Uh, so we went to the bamboo bush, it became our, our, our home again after the school. My uncle's wife, the one who got shot in a, in a hair, was with, with me. Uh, she couldn't move. She had to stay outside of the bamboo bush. When we ran, when the kiddos came at nine, we had to run in the bamboo bush. She couldn't, so mm -hmm. she slept there. I had my other uncle's wife who couldn't even moved either because she had um, she had a tu tumor, some type of tumor at the very beginning of the, the genocide and it kept getting worse and worse. I had my uh, cousin, Lunyonga, who was uh, kind of like out of it because she was beating her head mm -hmm. when we were at the school. She's, um, uh, she's out there, she's not moving. Um, I had my uh, I haven't talked about uh, my brother Simp. Mm -hmm. I think I kind of skipped that, mm -hmm. skipped that, but I'll come back to that. So I had Simp over there. So I had about four people from my family who are just laying there waiting for kiddos to come and just slot them. We had a Hutu worker who was watching our cows, uh, who was taking care of our cows, but. I'm, I'm gonna say that God is grace because he got sick of malaria. And when he got sick of malaria, he be, uh, at the very beginning, he moved with us. Instead of joining other Hutus, he came with us. Mm -hmm. At the very beginning, he got malaria, so he couldn't eat, move either. So he stayed with my family out by the, 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 the bamboo bush. I'll call you a bank if I, if I need to. Mm -hmm. But, uh, when Kiras came and they saw him with them and he identified himself uh, as a person who worked for them and they treated him good, they didn't touch them. Mm. So, um, but Simba, okay, I'm going, I'm going to get yeah. to the Simba yeah, now. Please, yeah, yes. Yeah. So 
Simba was that person. Uh, he was my older brother, a person I looked uh, to, um, and a very, very hardworking person. Every time when we were at the bamboo bush, he was the person who would go out back to where we used to live, knowing that in, in his way he can meet with kiddos anytime. He will sneak and go get food for us. So, and one day, like he was used to, he, when we heard that kiddos were coming, he wanted to go back and hide where they, they've already been. And he was not successful at that time. He'd done it for a while, from the very beginning of the genocide, even at the church. But at this point, he just ran into them. And when he ran into them, they attacked him like, like crazy because they knew him. They knew him, he was capable that, to fight them. He had a, a traditional weapon. Uh, he had a sword. So when they saw him, they just like, it's like a dog seeing like, you know. So um, they attacked him, cut him everywhere. Uh, I knew he was able to defend himself. Um, um, he might even had hurt some of them uh, so bad. Um, and so they left him in the bamboo bush in the water, in a pool of water, thinking that he was, he was dead, but he was like wounds everywhere. It's like those who I just showed you, mm -hmm. even worse than that. So he was trapped there. Uh, my uncle really couldn't go there and uh, help him. Um, you know, I don't know if that was selfishness, but the only person who was able to go and say, I gotta go check on him was me. Uh, at that age, I was like, I gotta go find him. So so I went and checked on him. Um, he was very courage. He was, uh, uh, he, he was very um, hopeful. Uh, he, I was desperate but he was not as desperate as I was. That's how strong he was. He would look at me, and I would look at him, I would be crying, he would be like, Sir, don't worry about me. Be strong, take care of yourself. I'm like, I look at him, I'm like, I don't even understand what you're talking about, you know? And from that point in my mind, I was like, if you've been protecting us, for, for this long, trying to get food for us, what can I do for you besides being by you? So I started, you know, every day I'll make sure you get some food. Um, I'll go ask um, people at the camp, you know, Bamboo Bush now is our camp. So I'll go there and say, hey, you know, can I have extra, can I have a potato? People were able to get some food. Can I have a potato? I would ever, I would, I, would, I, would, I would be hungry, but I would want him to eat. Mm -hmm. So I go get a potato here, I get a cassava here, here, you know, a type, uh, banana here, you know, give to him. And every time I was him, uh, by him, he would encourage me to say, Serge, it's gonna be okay. I'm like, you know, when, when, um, when, um, Somebody's talking about being okay, having wounds here. You can easily see inside of his body. You can see magnet in 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 his wounds everywhere, and he still say that it's gonna be okay. So I stay there. We stay there. Uh, of course, said on daily basis, it was run, run, run. You know, they come at nine. You're ready to run. They kill probably half of it, half, half of of your group. You come back next day, you just like, when am I dying next? You know. Yeah, you talked about it became fairly routine and that at nine o'clock it would start. Yes. You kind of run all day to try to make it to five. Five. Like so it was like that uh, for a while. Um, at night we had a house and person who used to live by the bamboo bush and who was among us. So we would go sleep there. Uh, but that was being desperate um, because we, the house was too small for, you know, 
anybody. It's just that, you know, we will go there. A lot of times they would have just asked kids go there. But we almost got burnt over there too because we tried to light um, candle um, and um, because we were sleeping on banana leaves and they were dry and it was too many people sleeping on top of each other we almost uh, put a house on fire mm. so and that, I think that that was the last time I slept there mm. um, and so we stayed there um, of course the gun the gun we got from the soldier at the school, one of our guy has it. Uh, the guy who used to drive the police car uh, was a Tutsi. And so that time nobody knew how to use a gun beside a police or a soldier, mm -hmm. those two people. Mm -hmm. So although we got that gun from the kidders, it took us a while to find who's gonna be responsible for the gun. Nobody knew how to use a gun. A gun was like a toy. So by chance, oh, the guy said, oh, I know how to use it. Because he was driving police. Probably one of the police was very close to, close to him and probably gave him a lesson. So we said, hey, here is your toy. Um, and we gave him a, a gun. And um, of course, that soldier we killed uh, had um, extra bullets. He had a big big briefcase of, uh, of bullet. So we, you know, he kept the gun and that even made it worse because every time he would use it, the government would be, oh, now RPF is there. Mm. They knew nobody had a gun and nobody knew know how to use a gun. Now they can hear a gun. So that even made government put a lot of attention to us. So, um, I, in a book, I talk about how he was discovered the one time with his gun. No, 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 no. How they hired his gun and they came looking for him. They ran into um, one of my teacher, um, uh, who was kind of funny because uh, they said they, they ran into him and he had a machete. And they said, we're going to kill you. And he said, I'm going to kill you too. He had a machete. They had a gun. <laughs> so, uh, and he survived. You know, so I don't know how I survived, but so in the bamboo bush we lived there. Um, it, it was people who who are alive and dead body living together, because uh, in the book I talk about how um, my um, my teacher, uh, uh, my one of my favorite teacher was killed in, in there. And I happened to sleep by him, um, you know, because you you didn't have any other any other place to sleep. Whether it's smelly or it's not smelly, you you gotta you gotta find a place to put your head down for at least a few minutes. Where is wet? Because I remember she, he was sleeping in the in he was he was dead and he was in the mud, and I slept by him without knowing when I woke up. In the morning, oh, he's Rujerinyan, my teacher. So uh, we lived that life. I remember um, when uh, this woman came across me and said, oh, young boy, uh, that's my husband. He was a kid and he had some money um, in his pocket and his uh, pants sleeve. So I had to roll it over and put the money and give it to her um, because, you know, she asked me. And like, like I said, we were numbed. So I, we don't have a feeling, just open it. Hey, where is it? It there, Get it, give it to her. But money was like papers because what would you use it for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't buy anything. So it was just being naive. Um, so. And so we lived there, and it got to the point where all that time we were living in the bamboo bush, we can hear um, guns, uh, heavy guns. And that time, RPF was making progress um, and was basically winning over the killers 
uh, the government, the, the kidding government. Mm -hmm. um, so, so up until this time, you hadn't had any contact or news uh, about the RPF? No, no, we have no idea what's going on whatsoever. But uh, some of the some of those mature guys, they they were like they were they would always give us morale, saying, "Oh." RPF will be here soon. RPF will be here soon. Uh, my, uh, you know, I'm ready to be dead any time. So, and let me go back before I finish. Talk about my uncle. I talk about who was killed and uh, who was attacked several times, and um, they would cut his parts. Um, my uncle Atanas, who was a very um, uh, hardworking person. A person to look up to, but um, when we were at the school, um, he used to do like uh, his son used to do. He used to go where people have killed and hide. Um, but he didn't start doing that until he, he was a t he was shot on his hip. He couldn't move no more. He couldn't move as mu as much as we were moving. So he had to go back where they attacked, hoping that they would just pass him. Because like, if they knew that they've already finished four off, they won't come. They would just pass four off, go through four off, but because they know they've already done their job. Mm -hmm. And they'll come to daughters. Um, so he, he did that, going back where they've been, hoping that he can survive that way and got to the point where they found him. So they discovered him. They discovered him, what, what they did was like, what they did to Jesus. Um, they um, cut him, his mouth, his, today they'll come and cut his mouth, his, tomorrow they'll come and cut his ear, because they knew where he was. So it would be in their way to come find us, they will stop there and do something to him until he was finally gone. Um, last time they cut him, his jaw separate both sides. Um, by that time, his both arms were gone. So they cut him in pieces for several days. And all we can do is to come and check on him. You can't move him because he's basically dead. Um, and you can't finish him. You can't kill your person. So we were like out of no options, out of options. So. Hey, we will come and check on you, like your your kids, but we can't do nothing. And we talk to him; he's very hopeful. Hey, my kids, be strong. Be be example out there. And you're like, I don't think you know what you're talking about. So, you know, she got he got to where he you know he was finished, and we came and buried him, and we continue uh, and. It got to the point where we're like, you know, it's it's you now. It's probably me next minute. So, and I have Agnes um, and and her husband. They also died like that. Um, Agnes's husband was shot during the battle, and when he was shot during the battle, his wife, instead of running with us, she wanted to hide with her husband, and they went back like. You know, the trick my uncle was using and the one Simba was using, they wanted to go back and hide where the killers have been. And they discovered them. When they discovered them, they they torched them, torched them um, and let them go. Um, they lived with us, ran with us for several days, wounded. And again, they say, oh, let's go again, try to hide where they've been. They discovered them. So that's when they killed him and finished him. So um, we moved to, let me go back to the bamboo bush. Um, so on several occasions, we run every day, every day. Helicopter comes in every day to see how many numbers, you know, to do inventory on us. And then um, RPF uh, finally won over. Uh, they came all the way from Uganda went to Mutara province, all the way to Chigari, Chigari to Wigesera. It's like coming from Washington across the, 
from the north to the to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So they were already, you know, and they come to us. Uh, we hear people saying, "Oh, RPF is very close. RPF is very close." Mm. And we're like, "No, no, 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 no! You're trying to be very naive. They can't. How would they get make it here?" Some people, no, they they are coming. They are coming. And I'm like, you know, and then um, all of a sudden, uh, we we heard um, um, a voice of an uh, old woman coming down saying, oh, I saw my son, um, my son is here, and my son had joined the RPF um, a while back. And people were like, stop being uh, trying to fool us because it sounds like probably the government, you know, gave you bribe and you want us to go so they can trap us and kill us. Uh, we can get trapped and be killed. So we... Um, some of us, especially me, who was like, hey, let's go, we, we just ran toward the, the direction the lady was coming from. Um, because that, her son had come and found her on a bed. Mm -hmm. She was like this old woman who can really move. But when her son came and said, hey, mom, I know you're suffering. I know you, you know, but I, you got to go find your people and tell them we are here. Because they didn't want to come down, because they didn't know what's what what is around. Mm -hmm. So, so we we ran as we ran over, we found it's one of our, our person. He 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 wasn't like a person. He was like a, he was like you know you you wouldn't describe him. This is a person who's been fighting so hard to get to his people. So he said, okay, um, now the plan is you keep going and send us, send some other people to go back and bring people. So by me, I was like, I gotta go. So we kept going and they were pointing us to the capital city of my district. Um, so we moved there. I remember some guys who were with us had some machete, traditional weapons. We got to where they had those soldiers, RPF soldiers had, they were in, uh, in ditches. Um, so as we walk in the street, they would just uh, put their heads up and say, hey, keep going. Look for who's telling you to keep going. Like, And then some of our guys had traditional weapons that kept, they wanted to hold on to them. And they, as they passed those guys in, uh, in, 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 in the halls, they would be like, leave your weapon there and keep going. And our, our guys would be like, who's telling me to leave my weapon I've been using to defend myself for all along? Mm -hmm. And they will be like, it's us, RPF. You put it down or we kill you. Because the reason why they, they wanted us to put the weapons down, they didn't want us to, uh, to they didn't want us some killers to be, to hide among us. And then when we get there, they come back and kill, kill us. So that was a strategic, strategic uh, point. Say so drop it. Some guys try to resist and they tie them up. Say hey, you can't resist. You gotta go. Mm -hmm. So we went. We went to the city, and as uh, I got to the city, uh, I just my mind couldn't just be stable. I was like. Uh, I gotta go back to see if Simba because Simba was still laying down, and Runyonga had also. Um, I think I think Runyonga had died be, uh, prior to the arrival of RPF, so I, my, my whole reason I had to go back was Simba. Mm -hmm. So Simba died like the last minute when RPF like reached the the bamboo because. Mm -hmm. As we were going this way, RPF was coming this way. Some of the guy, RPF guys were uh, staying uh, stationed in a way, in, in the middle of, between um, the city and the village. Some were coming this way. So that was a strategic way uh, of how they fought. So as, as soon as the last RPF person said hello to Simba, Simba died and Simba, was the person who really wanted to see RPF. Mm -hmm. 
in the book, I talk about how he used to sneak and go visit RPF where they were camped in, um, in one of the province. When there were lab labels, they, um, they were camping in, uh, in the north part of Rwanda and Simba would sneak in his way to school because he was in a boarding school. In his way, instead of going to school, he goes visit them because my uncle was among RPF. So he really wanted to see RPF. As soon as he said hello to an RPF person, he just died. So we buried him and we, we moved to Nyamata. So Nyamata was the city and over there, it was chaos, you know. It, we are with happiness, but we have a lot of uh, wound people, uh, uh, wounded people, we had um, all kind of um, disease, like you know, all the kinds of sicknesses, like malaria, cholera, uh, pneumonia, uh, malnutrition, like y you name it, all kinds of uh, sicknesses you find in any kind of uh, refugee camp. So, and some people will get diarrhea in the morning and at 10 we bury them. Um, some people will get diarrhea and about four hours later, we bury them. So it was like, even if we survived and not many people survived, we still have another battle to fight. So RPF was there to try to provide us anything we can. They can give us clothes, shelter. But I remember I slept outside for a while. Um, yeah, they're very undersupplied. I mean, they don't yes. have a lot to give mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And as uh, survivors, we're trying to get into um, stores to find stuff. And and some some of our guys died just because they went into. Um, into a store that had gasoline in it and they light up and they would catch fire and they would die there. Um, I'm, I myself, I was in one, um, I was with another guy trying to find candies. I was all, all about candies. Um, and uh, this guy used the lighter and the, the store catch fire. So we had to go through the window. Um, so we were going through so much um, at once. Uh, all of a sudden, RPF restored peace, um, and then it had to be a question of, you know, who's responsible, who, who's the father, who's the son, because most of the father are gone. Um, e women who are alive, they are raped, or they're in a the hospital because they are wounded, or they're sick, they have diarrhea, malaria, all kind of uh, illnesses. So it was a surviving moment that really didn't have a description. Um, I'm sure there's some vengeance. Yes, ven to, yeah. yeah, vengeance. Um, RPF was like, especially soldiers really were very, very angry because all the way from the border to the other border, all they had to see is dead body of their family members or their people, especially the people they know that they died when they were innocent. They were killed because, when they were innocent. They were killed because of the way they were born, uh, a way that they didn't choose to. So it was, anger was everywhere. Um, so... And then, you know, it was, it was a battle for a while, yeah. Um, one of the stories that you tell is, is getting to take a shower or getting to clean yourself for the first time. Yes. Uh, I, I, after not having shower or a change of clothes or... Yes. Yeah, 100 um, days. Yeah, 100 days, yeah. I, I really... Um, I can't really forget that shower. Um, my first shower was, um, water was very scary first, you know. Um, you know, I took a shower when I moved to Chigari with my uh, my boss. Um, 
and we got into Kigali, he's like, ah, oh, he's a shower. You got a shower. I'm like, you know, and the shower was, the cold water was cold and uh, so. Do, do I talk about it in the book? Yeah, you talk about the lice. The, oh, yeah. the, yes, the, yes, the lice. Oh, the, I had lice to where like I can easily like move them and just like throw them and you, <laughs> you know, yeah, I can get a full of it and just, you know, and that was normal because, mm -hmm. you know, everybody had that, mm -hmm. you know, no, sh no washing your clothes for a hundred days. It's, so I would imagine there's a period right after this where you're just trying to find all your family and figure yes. out where everyone is. I, I'm, I'm one of those person who really didn't stick with the family all the time. Um, I was all the time finding a way to survive, but at the same time trying to take care of my people who were um, desperate, like my... My brother, I, I knew that was my, my responsibility to take care of him. Mm -hmm. And so uh, while my family member or relatives were like, oh, you know, you know, where do I need to go hide? My mind was like, how can I go find food for Simba? Mm -hmm. um, and they, all the time I, when I was hiding, my mind was like, I gotta go check on the scene first. And when it starts, then I'll run. So. Um, do you remember when you, um, I mean, you had your first good night's sleep again? I mean, where you actually got to rest and where you felt like you began to recover some of your strength? And um, you know, when we were in Nyamata, uh, we had <clears throat> my uncle, my my uncle's wife, the one that had a tumor, mm -hmm. uh, the one who was shot, they were still al alive. Um, those two. Oh, and my brother, I forgot but one of my brother, Eric, um, he had a wound on uh, his leg. He was in the hospital, so those three are in the hospital. So every single day, my uncle, my other uncle, one who had a wife who was shot in the leg had to get a job at a hospital to cook so she, he can take care of his wife mm. and a family member. And all of a sudden, he he got diarrhea as well. Um, so when he got diarrhea, it was up to me and his son to take care of him. So it was like we were living in the same situation. Mm. Um, until when I moved to Chigari um, with, um, with a soldier. And when we got there, when I had to shower, um, after I shower, I, they gave me good clothes, new clothes. Um, when I slept that night, I think I felt good mm -hmm. because I had new clothes, I, had, I took shower. I had tea uh, with sugar in it. Um, you know, that was, in fact, I had sugar, uh, uh, tea with sugar before I had left the city, the Yamata city, the mm -hmm. one I was, we, the, our first stop after the genocide. Mm -hmm. So I had tasted on sugar before, mm -hmm. um, but when, you, when I got to Chigari, I had a shower, had a good clothes, very warm clothes, and um, I had a tea again, mm -hmm. uh, slept in a very good house in the capital city of Chigari. Oh, that was that was wonderful, and knowing that the the kiras had um, the 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 kiras left the country, and now everything is in, that is in the country, you know, would be would be given to people mm -hmm. instead of kiras. So that that made me even happier. Well, um, I know you have a, a very colorful story after that, and then, and a lot of that we won't be able to get into today. But I, you know, I, 
you have a very good memory, but I, I, you know, the things that I just can't imagine your age being exposed to all the things that you were exposed to incident after incident after incident. And so what are the things that kind of stand out to you or really stay with you or when you think about it, come back to you about it? Um, Okay, sure. I don't want to have to stop it. Yeah, so we'll pick up with that question. Okay. Oh, stop like over overnight, they just have one meeting in in the headquarters in DC. They can say, no, you 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 are gone, and they can do that. Are you ready? All right, we're picking up again, and I, I want to make the note that I didn't say earlier that uh, also on our project team, we have Dr. Melissa Sloan is here and Nathan Roberts here as well um, with us. But I want to pick up on that question that I asked you, just maybe some of the things that, you know, I know you've thought about it a lot and you've told your story a lot, but maybe even not when you're telling your story, but when you're, uh, the things that come back to you from it that really stand out. Um, things that come that stands out to me, uh, there are not many, but um, one thing is that those dead bodies um, comes in my mind very often, and 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 that raises a lot of questions. Um, instead of like being traumatized by that, it, it raises a lot of questions uh, in my mind. And and I won't say those questions are bad though, because it, re it raises questions like, who are we? Who, who are we? Uh, why do you treat another person like that? And it takes me back. Um, and I, so first of all, it makes me wanna keep going. Uh, Secondly, it makes me wonder what kind of uh, people we were that at that time. Um, was it evil among us? Was it lack of education? Was uh, uh, that in our nature? Um, and I put all those things together. I come back and uh, I make a conclusion of saying, no, it was a lack of education uh, because with education, you won't, you really won't see any anything beneficial in killing a person uh, because when you're educated, you know that a person next to you deserves the same rights as, as you deserve when you're educated. And, and 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 you see that the government, um, the killing government was able to um, kill that many people because they they were the mastermind of the genocide. But because the the small people didn't have education, they were able to accomplish that. So and also that raises the question. How can you be educated and you are a prisoner or a minister and you still think that you can kill people? So, so a lack of education is one of them, but also a, um, science without conscious is nothing. So learning in the school without moral mm -hmm. education is really nothing important. Mm -hmm. um, well, that, that's... This leads to my next question because several times you talk about uh, providence or you know God directing things, and so I, I'm wondering. You know, earlier you talked about church was just something you went to. I know it's a, your, your faith story goes on from there and becomes something very different for you. Right. And so, how do you think about that as you think about that experience and you think about your beliefs? How, how do those relate? Um, it, it really doesn't really connect mm -hmm. 
much um, because my faith tells me that when you are going through something, instead of coming to you and say, hey, God is testing you, or that happened because of God, God I, I feel like I just need to join you. And, and, and be with you because um, we used to hear people we used I mean we people in Rwanda we are used to good preaching good scriptures we, we are used to that and we probably can have people who can call the Bible like like this but can really practice the scripture so to me, my faith is very different than many people. Um, I'm that person that say, you, sh- you do it. Don't, don't, don't say, it, just do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I guess, okay, let me answer your question, I think, in a better way. I've lost faith in people. Um, and I don't trust people very much. I just want people to do to 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 do it and then i see it and then i i interpret myself mm-hmm. so I, I don't like when people come to me and say oh um i'm a nice person i i, I i've done this and then this and this no because it takes me a while to trust a person and um this probably, uh, my wife can probably tell you this uh, better mm-hmm. because um, there are so many things that happens and she's like, you, you, you need to change. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I understand, but you know, it's just what happened to me, you know? Because when you see your neighbor, you, ate together, you went to a party together, you just like, it's like your neighbors was connected to you like more than your father and your mother, but your neighbor come back and kill you. How are you going to trust anybody? You know, and I'm, I'm always like this way. Uh, you do what you want to do. If that changed the the word, good job. But if you, what you're doing is not changing people in a good way, you know. So, it's, yeah, I don't know if I'm explaining that. No, you are. Yeah, so. Well, the other thing that you learn through your story is uh, that it's in you to help other people. That, that you, you know, I think of you there and you're caring for the people that you were caring for, and, and even your relationship with Simba during that period where you're caring for him. And I know that has affected who you are now and, yes. and how you want to make a difference. And so could you talk a little bit about that? Right. Um, I, uh, I tend not to seem like a person who cares about my close uh, people. And that's because I'm already, I always do that based on my experience because I saw a government leaving its people behind. Um, no, no, I saw a government abusing its its own people. Mm-hmm. And that's why I always feel like I need to get out there and get to those people who are not connected to me mm-hmm. and take care of them. I'll give you an example. At my work, um, I've told all my co-workers, my fellow managers, I say, please, if you, if we talking and you don't think I'm, I care, it's not I don't care. I care about my employee, employees more than I care about you. You are a fellow manager. I want to protect them. And, and so when managers are coming, say, oh, write them up. Uh, let's get them out. No, wait, wait. You, just, you know, you are there to back them up. You are there to care for them. You are there to 
make them a better per people. So it, it, it made me, um, I have a heart for people that really don't, people don't see where it comes from. My father, I, I know my father made a comment, maybe we're not gonna say this one, <laughs> but my father made a comment and said, oh, how should it be the house for children and he doesn't have his own house? You know, and I was like, uh, if, you, if, if, you had, if you had to go through what I had to go through, you probably build one. You probably build 10, 10 for kids, so. That's and, that, and that's about your uh, um, foundation Right. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, the foundation, um, so I, when I came in America, um, you know, I was a, a, an athlete. And all I thought about was being athlete, being an um, academic person, and just take care of myself. And as I continued to reflect on my story, uh, my, exper my experiences, uh, those dead bodies that that keeps coming in my mind, I'm like, um, I, I gotta do something better than that person who killed those people. Um, I, I, I gotta do better than um, other people who just care about themselves. So I say, I need to help kids, um, especially kids who lived um, type of life I live. And um, uh, that time I, I couldn't see any type of income I, I, I could have to help many kids. But I was like, you know, being in America or being having a type of education I have, maybe somehow, somewhere I can help. So I, um, I, I initiated a, 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 some type of um, a foundation that was kind of like me just foundation me. And and I talked that to my wife, I said, you know, because my wife and I had pre, pretty much had to go through the same thing, because she survived the uh, genocide from Congo as well. Um, and her mom was killed in, camp, in a refugee camp in Burundi um, after USA uh, brought them in here. So we we've always talked about <clears throat> being a positive influence, uh, looking back, you know, just sitting down and relax. And um, we got to the point where we were like, you know, you work part-time. She was working part-time 20 hours as a student, minimum wage, seven and a half dollars. And same with me, I was doing uh, school and was working part-time, international student, making, you know, minimum wage, 20 hours a week. So we keep saying we're going to help uh, kids, but we, we, we don't make any move. And we, we identified a, plan, a program in Rwanda where it's called a mutual fund uh, schema where people put, um, you know, everybody have to pay insurance, but it's that insurance is very low. So that time every person was paying two dollars for insurance for a whole year. That includes medical beers, you know, hospital, shots, whatever. So I was like, two dollars. How often do you, you know, do you tip two dollars? How often do you go McDonald's and, and get french fries? And it's like, we can pay probably 75 each one of us and pay um, insurance for many kids. So we went, you know, a house on, uh, watching a TV and we, we came up with that idea. So we paid about 130 something um, kids uh, for insurance. And we were very encouraged, you know, getting emails from kids in Rwanda or people in Rwanda say, oh, what are you doing is great. And I continue to share that with um, people I have, uh, um, person I used to go to church to with um, and he became more like a father um, and I shared that with him uh, his name is Van Conway he's right now he's the president of the uh, the foundation um, and I shared that with him he was like oh no that's uh, you can't just keep things like that to yourself let's share that with people at church 
So we share that with people at church and they're like, oh, we want to participate. So next time we, we, um, we had about 1,000 children um, covered uh, with insurance. And I kept doing it, me and my wife, and with a small group, and, and people were like, y- you can do more. We're behind you. And, and I, I, I started thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm lim- limiting God. I'm, I'm just limiting God to what he can do. So um, in the summer, again, I sat down with my wife and said, well, what can we do again? People are behind us, but if they are behind us, that means they can be doing what we were doing. But, and then we can grab another task. So I was like, maybe they can continue to take care of insurance, and men, then me and my wife can grab another task to help people. So we said, we're going to be the house for children. <clears throat> so my wife and I, you know, we had already scheduled to go to the bank and get a loan of 8000 House take it cost 10000 or 15000 that time. And we said, we're going to go get a loan. We're going to build it. When it get to where we need 2000 more, we can probably have that time saved or we can get another loan. So as we were doing that, a friend of us said, come said, I need to join you. So we built the house. And after that, we said, let's put our first children in it. We put a six children, no, four children. And after we put four children, the mayor, uh, through uh, a friend of mine, and a person that I know um, reached to me, said, reached out to me and said, we have these kids that are living in the street, the one I was describing to you earlier today. Uh, could you do something for them? And I said, sure. Uh, it can't be too small not to have uh, a kid, kids who are living on the street. So we put those kids in. And um, that friend of mine, my um, adoptive pa- parents, they came to Rwanda. Uh, they saw it. They saw how kids like got changed. Kids who are like this close to die got changed. They're like, you know, we got to be behind this. So because when we put those kids in the house, they were there. And kids were like about to die. Um, they said, can we do more? I said, I, I, my wife and I can only do what we can. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say you join us. Um, if you want, you join us, but we we're only going to take care of these six kids because that's what we can, we can afford. They said, no, 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 no. We can do more. So they opened up. Uh, that's when they formed a board um, for the foundation. And the board said, we need to build more houses. So right now they're in the process of building 10 more houses. So how many kids will it? Probably 70, 73 or 80, 85. And so, you know, and, and they are also talking about maybe having a clinic, um, you know, a school. So, and all that, I, I'll be lying to you that I spend even a minute thinking about it. I, I, I just say, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. If it's not going to happen, it, you know, so. It's amazing. Yep. And, and that keeps me going too, you know. When when you know, sometimes when I go to work, my you know my boss is probably not happy about my performance. My wife, I go home, she's mad of, for some reason. My kids are like angry because I'm away from them, and I meet people in the street they are mean at me. I, I still keep going because I, I know for some reason some I'm I'm doing something. Um, for somebody who will not be, you know, be alive. So. Well, I, the other members of our project team may want to ask you some questions. Yeah. I have uh, one question. Um, people that have read your book and met you and heard your story um, and are touched by it, uh, what do you want them to do? Uh, they want to. What, I mean, what? What would you like them? Having heard your story, what would you like them to do? What can they do? Uh, one thing I want um, 
to do is to speak up for um, innocent people that are continue to die, to, to get that, to, to be killed. Um, and you find out that those people being killed are in small countries. Um, um, you know, we know that in Mexico, people are being killed because of drugs, and, and you, sometimes you can't really do much about it. Of course you can, you know, at some point, but when you know that a country um, is killing its own people and there is a, something we call United Nations that you know, should be doing something in their, you know, in their power and it's not happening, that raises a question of ignorance. Um, so if those people can go and rescue those countries, you know, of course each country got to have independence and um, freedom of, of choice, things like that, but I don't think they got to have a choice of killing people. So if that happens, can you just, can we all get together and say, hey, enough is enough? We, because at the end of the day, we are all human beings. So if you get, they can speak up to, um, uh, speak up for, you know, stopping genocide, you know, you know, genocide never again, um, and, and not just focus on themselves. Because uh, if I'm doing things for kids, I, I could be doing things for myself, but you know, you're in this position, in this position, where you in this position since you was born, or this is some blessings you got from God. Can you share those blessings with other people? So that's basically what I want people from to get from my book. Yeah. Well, and that's definitely the, the spirit within which this project was done. So I right. appreciate you sharing that. So now, before we end, I want to make sure if there's anything else that you would like to make sure you share that we didn't touch on. Um, no, I, there is a lot. Yes, uh, there is a lot. Um, you know, I, I talk about in the book how I came in America and, and, um, and, and, and some people think that I take life so hard. Um, some people th say that I think like a um, 50 years old person um, and um, when I'm not and, and, and that's because the life experience I had to go through. Uh, when you start, when you raise yourself um, from seven years old and, and you get to this point, you know, so mm -hmm. th there's a lot. But you're welcome to ask me questions. You can call me, marry me. Um, I mean, if you if you think about anything that I didn't sh cover and I covered that in a book, and you think it would be beneficial for your project, because um, when when I got your email, I was like, this is kind of you know strange, you know. <laughs> I'm like, and then I was like, why why would I need to do this? And then I was like, you know, you never know because it, it, you gotta take. Uh, advantage of every opportunity, you know, because uh, who, who knows who's going to hear my story. Well, I uh, appreciate you sharing it as part of that education you said that's so right. important. Right. People need to know and understand. Uh, right. So and if I can change one person for these two hours I spent here, it's worth it. It's worth it, you know. I will thank you. No problem. No problem.